Good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled, Rational Design of Modified Release Dosage Forms from Pharmacokinetic Targets through Technology Selection. My name is Andrew Jernan, and I'll be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes, and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive, so please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. And at this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode, and the presentation slides will advance automatically for you. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future download. And at this point, I would like to thank Bend Research, who have helped develop the content for this presentation. Bend Research is a leading independent scientific development and manufacturing company. For more than 35 years, its multidisciplinary teams have pioneered and advanced technologies to solve its clients' most challenging technical problems. Bend Research has numerous capabilities to support the advancement of promising drug candidates from conception through commercialization. These include formulation and dosage form support, process development and optimization, and CGMP manufacturing. It's a leader in novel drug de delivery technologies, including spray drying, hot melt extrusion, and controlled release, and has expertise in inhalation and biotherapeutics development. The company employs more than 250 people and has six state-of-the-art facilities located in Bend, Oregon. Now, I would like to introduce our first speaker for today's event, and that is Chris Craig. He is a director of dosage form product development at Bend Research. His expertise spans physical chemistry, process and pharmacokinetic modeling, engineering design, formulation and process development, and scale-up. His knowledge in the areas of spray-dried dispersion fundamentals um, and dosage forms supports a variety of client projects. He's developed immediate and modified release dosage forms involving dry granulation, direct compression, particle size reduction, cosmetic and functional pan coating, and laser drilling. Mr. Craig joined Ben Research in 1998 and holds a BS in chemical engineering from the University of Rochester. Our second speaker for today's event is Brett Caldwell, PhD. Dr. Caldwell is a Director of Formulation Science at Bend Research. His current responsibilities include leading client compound-specific technology development programs involving solubilization, modified release dosage forms, and inhalation. He has significant project-based experience working with immediate release and controlled release solid dosage form formulations of solubilized and crystalline dosage forms, relying on fundamental knowledge of solid state physical chemistry, crystallization, and pharmacokinetics. Dr. Caldwell joined Ben Research in 1999 after postdoctoral research at the University of California, Berkeley. He earned his MS and PhD degrees in inorganic chemistry from Northwestern University after receiving his bachelor's degree from Indiana's Wabash College. He is a co-inventor on three U.S. patents and patent applications and has written and published uh, 13 articles. And without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to Chris Craig. Chris, you may begin when ready. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Pop this up. There we go. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here to this morning and this afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the webinar here, give a, um, uh, in addition to what was mentioned earlier, a brief introduction to what is Bend Research here. I'd um, like to take this opportunity um, here to, to, to let everybody know that this uh, work that's being presented here is, is, uh, uh, represents many of the employees here at the company and would not be possible without the uh, um, key problem statements provided to us by our clients. Um, we are, uh, as I said, an integrated facility allowing us to go from the research all the way down through uh, GMP, making clinical supplies here. 
uh, like to jump in and talk about uh, first off what we're not. Uh, what we're not is, is we're not, our approach is not to go in and to vend uh, specific technologies. Uh, what, we, what we do is we want to work with the client in a collaborative mode so that we can uh, identify and obtain the desired uh, product profiles here. And what we do is we use uh, uh, a wide available uh, technologies, disciplines, and our know-how to uh, allow us to achieve um, these goals. So what's the important part here for us? The important part is, is that uh, um, our selection for technologies is driven by the product requirements. And as this uh, slide shows here, the key areas that we want to do is we want to um, identify the, uh, uh, the, the product profiles here that we're looking at. And what we have listed on this slide is sort of some example profiles here of, of uh, um, problem statements that are presented. And then from that, what we do is we want to then overlay what possible technologies could be used to allow us to, uh, uh, to solve that problem. And what we have presented here is just a, um, a small list of the technologies that are available. Uh, listed out is um, monolithic tablets, you know, classic tablets, not listed, you know, matrix tablets, uh, swallowable core, push-pull tablets. In addition to that, we have uh, um, a wide variety of multi-particulate um, products and technologies to allow us to, um, once we've identified what the uh, um, product profiles are and what the product requirements are, to allow us to apply the technologies to that. So when we actually have uh, um, multiple options available to us, um, to select and we've identified um, you know, possible target profiles here, what we can use is we can use some computational tools to allow us to do hypothesis testing there just to get an initial screening to allow us to determine if we think that these profiles that we're proposing and hypothesizing have a chance at actually uh, achieving the desired goal. Um, we are uh, here is relatively tool agnostic there. We're, we're more than happy to use some of the wonderfully available, commercially available tools. In addition to that, if there's anything that's required, we've done the areas there where we will actually create the, uh, the biological models required if there's some missing physics or we have to uh, specialized requirements there. So once we have that, I'll I'll jump into a, um, a first case study here. Um, where, as I mentioned, what we're doing is we're interested in trying to identify and um, line out what the, the particular requirements are for a, a, um, a modified release profile here. And in this particular case, what we'll illustrate is the ZMAX uh, product that uh, uh, we worked on. And our client came to us with this uh, um, profile here where they wanted to be able to deliver a large dose of uh, antibiotics, in this case a two gram dose, uh, in a single uh, dosage form. And the problem there is if that dose was delivered uh, in an immediate release form, uh, you would lead to uh, adverse events uh, such as stomach upset and emesis there. So what that required is, is for us to, to blunt the uh, Cmax and to slow the release uh, of the drug. Unfortunately, if um, the release profile was slowed down too far, what would happen is you would have an, uh, resulting poor bioavailability, and then that would drop off on the, um, the efficacy of the, the resulting product. So with this in mind, this allowed us to establish what the client's requirements were in terms of trying to establish the target profile. So our approach in this case um, was to look at, uh, um, because of the large dose and the requirement of a single dosage form, 
to look at a multi-particulate, and in this case it was in a sachet format that would allow us to accommodate the large dose here. And, and as a requirement, one of the product pro, uh, requirements there is that it would have good mouthfeel because the patients were going to be required to make up a sachet and swallow that down there, and you didn't want to have a gritty feel. So um, there was an upper limit uh, placed on the particle size diameter in order to maintain that good um, patient experience. And so what you can see in the, the uh, optical microscopy image here on the lower left is um, the actual multi-particulates uh, multi that we used, uh, and they were formed through a melt spray congeal process, which I will go through how that was actually manufactured there. And what that consists of um, is the active API along with uh, um, two excipients there, a carrier, which is a Comfortol uh, wax, which is uh, water insoluble, and then also a dis dissolution performance enhancer, which is uh, uh, the Lutrol Fluoxima. So the uh, formation of these um, uh, multi-particulates through MSC involved taking and blending the API and the excipients together, running them through an extruder, which the extruder was basically acting as a uh, uh, conveying system and heat pump to allow us to melt the wax and make a molten suspension feed. That suspension feed was then fed to um, a spinning disk, and the rotating spinning disk um, would create uh, uh, small droplets, and those droplets would be allowed to dry in, uh, during mid-flight, and then those could be collected. And because of the particular nature of this API, um, there was a small amount of API that would dissolve uh, in, the, in the hot wax. And so as a result, uh, there was an additional step required to anneal the cores, which would uh, uh, allow that to be recrystallized out and set the final uh, um, morphology of the uh, um, dosage form there. And then there's, of course, the final packaging. Um, some graphs up here that we're showing here is basically showing that uh, uh, we're able to control the, the uh, uh, particle size of the uh, multi-particulates through a combination of disk speed and um, suspension uh, feed rate there. Um, and again, this will allow us to have good control so that we could obtain the desired particle size, not only for a performance issue, uh, for performance-related uh, reasons, but also for um, patient uh, uh, experience there to make sure you maintain the good mouthfeel. Um, listed over on the left there, the particle size uh, of the microspheres do have an impact on the dissolution and the performance release there. Um, however, we are also able to control the, the material through um, uh, the, the actual ratio in the con uh, of the, the uh, excipients in here in addition to the physical size. So the actual um, zooming in here on the unit operation of the MSC and the actual uh, uh, spinning disk as I mentioned, what happened is the liquid feed is applied to the spinning disk, um, and then the ligands will form, and then those ligands will, uh, as they come off of the disk, will break up uh, in, uh, due to instabilities and form droplets. And those droplets uh, will then continue to fly through. As you can see uh, uh, on the right is a picture of uh, uh, one of our early development units there for uh, uh, doing formulation screening. And the material is, uh, with the spinning disk in the center, is allowed to fly off. And then there's a containment uh, collection device there that allows it uh, a drying time so that the material can re-solidify and go back to a solid particle. And then that's uh, able for ready collection. Um, so how do these things work? So the material, the, um, Crystalline drug is embedded in the, in the wax uh, matrix, and the wax matrix is water impermeable, and what we have in there is a pore former, and the pore former allows the interconnection of uh, 
the drug crystals uh, to each other and also to the surface of the, of the uh, um, microsphere. And once the uh, microsphere enters the GI milieu, uh, water is allowed to dissolve uh, those pores and then come in, enter into the microsphere, dissolve the crystalline uh, API, and then um, solution is then able to be pumped out of the um, uh, microsphere via um, uh, osmotic pressure there to build up just due to the solution. Uh, the drugs being dissolved there, uh, and essentially the uh, the cascading network um, allows the release of the drug. An important thing there is is the the level of the the lutrol there. The more lutrol that you place into the the system there, the more interconnections and the more pores you can have that will go to the surface. As a result, what that does is that will allow uh, a higher uh, release rate. It, it equilibrates out to a higher release rate. As you drop off the number, the amount of uh, uh, pore former in the microsphere, that actually will allow you to control the, the release profile there to allow you to tune it so that you can get your desired release profile. Um, an important thing that we always like to do when even on the uh, candidate drive line there is to be able to learn and understand how to extend uh, these technologies and these understandings to uh, other candidates and other other um, experiences here. And the graph on the right, what we've been able to do is, is extend the learnings here. As you can see, is this is all for a specific compound for the azithromycin at a specific drug solubility, but through uh, good understanding of the system, you're able to extrapolate out and understand how the drug uh, solubility will impact uh, the release as a function of the uh, Luchol content, allowing you to extend uh, your knowledge of this particular area into other drug candidate areas. So um, going back to where we were with the, um, the case study there is we were asked to um, have a fast enough release rate such that we could uh, obtain acceptable bioavailability, but not too fast that we would, uh, so that we could still demonstrate acceptable toler tolerability of the, uh, um, the API in regards to GI um, events. Um, and as you can see on the left there, we have the ability to control and to tune the release profiles of the, um, uh, of most of the, the release of the drug. And that control was demonstrated in uh, human clinical trials. Um, what's shown on the, the graph on the bottom with the, the human clinical data there is um, an immediate release suspension along uh, is the, the the, the drug that goes in high and crashes in, and then the, and the crashes and then goes in high and releases out and then the modified release uh, profile down below showing the reduction in C max but still able to obtain uh, acceptable uh, AUC and um, the graph on the right is just a, a summary of that showing how the we're able to obtain um, the desired AUC uh, and, and, and have actually a, uh, an acceptable window where we were both able to uh, maintain tolerability, have acceptable tolerability, and uh, maintain uh, acceptable bioavailability. And that is very strongly related to our in vitro uh, release profiles and our understandings there. So jumping on to uh, the next case study here, prior to, to, to going through this, this case study here, we'll, we'll go into a, uh, a taste masking case study. Um, and this will get a chance to introduce um, a new problem statement in a new area, which uh, required the addition of um, fluid bed coating and a fluid bed bit there. Um, I will let Brett go through the taste masking initiative, but before I do that, 
I will uh, um, give just a quick overview of uh, multi-particulates and uh, uh, the uh, generation of multi-particulates there. So fluid bed coating is a common unit operation in uh, the pharmaceutical industry here. And what, we'll do, what we do here is we use um, the fluid bed in a uh, Worcester coating mode for um, bottom coating to drug layer uh, up, to, to layer up, excuse me, uh, different drug layers onto a seed core. That allows us to determine the amount of API that we want to have on there. And then in addition, you can do a multitude of different uh, functional coatings onto the uh, drug layered API. Those can include, but are not limited to, of course, enteric, reverse enteric um, coatings or uh, osmotic bursting. The final dosage form of multi-particulates, um, there's a wide range of acceptable, you know, of options available, rather, for uh, uh, your final dosage form. The uh, multi-particulates can be included into uh, uh, traditional tablet dosage forms. Um, they can be delivered as sachet or bottles, or they can be uh, included into capsules, um, either as uh, individual multi-particulates or in mixtures if you're trying to uh, gain a more elaborate um, profile. So how, you know, as I mentioned, that uh, um, the scaling up and the commercialization of uh, multi uh, fluid bed coating is a well-established uh, process there. And um, there are uh, uh, numerous options for doing that there. In bend research, we have the availability for us to do a wide range of um, coating scales there. And what we've been also been able to do is take our understanding and process engineering knowledge and process quantitation to allow us to um, really understand the physical situation and what's going on in the, in the fluid bed. And that's allowed us to uh, scale down the uh, fluid bed coder. And we've been able to manufacture special inserts uh, to allow us to uh, start coding up with a, uh, a GLAT uh, down to the half a gram to a two gram starting bed weight. And that certainly allows us to uh, get in and uh, do a lot of good work for uh, case masking where we're trying to do some work on a uh, relatively low uh, bulk requirements there. So at this point, I'll turn the presentation over to Brett to allow him to take through the rest of the tape masking initiative. Thanks, Chris, and hello, everyone. This is Brett Caldwell. The next set of the next case study is a set of problem statements that are growing need in the industry, specifically taste masking. There are a variety of commercial and regulatory drivers for that need, whether it's a pure clinical need because the drug tastes bad to a specific population whether it, there's a need for marketing exclusivity for the pediatric filing to help with the, uh, you know, the lifetime of the drug, or also just life cycle management as, as you've already met a medical need but have a need to improve or uh, maintain its sales for some time. With those drivers, we try and match the physical situation and models for taste masking to the, the need of the, the project. And today I'm mainly going to focus on the top right, where we are altering the drug concentration through dissolution inhibition. There are other ways to taste mask, and on the summary table in a few slides with a variety of case studies, uh, we'll talk about a little bit of other methods by which you can modify taste. But with those market drivers, that model for how we're going to achieve taste masking and a set of drug properties brought along by the client, we can tailor a combination of core, coating, and dosage form to create an efficient, uh, to efficiently create a, a taste masking solution for nearly any drug. So our approach here is to limit the drug dissolution in the mouth, repeating the last slide, below a taste threshold. Ideally, that number comes from a taste panel or a clinical trial. And typically, the time course that we are targeting for taste masking specifically is a 15 to 30 minute delay. 
We're going to achieve that commonly by applying a functional barrier coating to a drug containing multi particulate. That active core or substrate, usually the desire is for it to be immediate release in nature because the desire is to be pharmacokinetically equivalent to an IR form, specifically for pediatric taste masking. But modified release, as Chris showed you with a melt spray congealed core, is, is easily possible uh, for some drugs given the solubility that they are. There are many technologies by which you can create a core that can be coated for taste masking. Chris has talked about melt spray congeal already, and we'll talk more through the fluid bed. Uh, example about spray layered multi particulates. The, the hallmarks of those two technologies for us is that they're very smooth and dense, so that they're extremely coatable, even at the small scale of 100, nan or 100 micron particles. And that, that, smooth and, that smooth surface allows us to minimize the coat weights, especially if we use a solvent-based coating process that requires no further curing steps as opposed to the, the more traditional aqueous latex coatings. When we get into the coating, typically we're just looking for some sort of delayed release, and there are a variety of mechanisms we can use to generate that delayed release. The simple and precedented versions are reverse enteric and enteric polymers. Those are simple and precedented, but they do have a pH dependence that we'll talk about how that can play into pharmacokinetics and profiles in a minute. As we get into the more complex uh, architectures and things that might not be as precedented in the literature or in the, the product environment, osmotic bursting is one that we'll talk about in the next case study as one that is pH independent and only time dependent. That, so that does have some uh, flexibility and some power for use also. With that coating and core combination that can be developed at a small API sparing scale using the techniques that we've described already, you can almost use any form, any drug form for the test or the market image that, of the client. Uh, that can be simple capsules that are then opened up and sprinkled. It could be a sachet as used in azithromycin, or it could be something more along the lines of a solid dosage form in, in the realm of orally disintegrating tablets or films. And that also can be phase appropriate according to the client need. So thinking about the technologies that we just described and how do we go through a, a decision tree to get to a rapidly select a lead formulation, the drug product profile is of utmost importance. There's usually an in vitro release target that you get from that, but you're trying to meet a bioequivalence to an existing drug product, perhaps. The combination of those two helps you, with the drug loading, helps you define a phase-appropriate dosage form and core coating combination. The drug properties then come into play really for selecting the, the core and how the drug will be presented to the patient. Keys here are solubility, whether it's aqueous, um, gastrointestinal media, or organic soluble. All of those can be tailored or can be utilized with solubilization if needed with fluid bed coating to achieve your pharmacokinetic goal. That can either be a milled crystal, so you'd reduce the drug size, especially for fluid bed coating, or it can be an amorphous form. That taste threshold is always the key here. We're trying to keep the solubility or the drug released in the mouth below a certain level to achieve the, the, the target product profile. With those parameters in mind, we can rapidly select some lead formulations with that core coating combination select the active substrate and come up with a, a coating solution that is amenable to the, the, pro, the project. Assuming that we're using a, a melt spray congeal on the bottom timeline, for example, a melt spray congeal with a single fluid bed coating, those are both scalable processes so we can develop them with a minimal amount of API and then rapidly scale those to a commercial scale once the lead formulation is identified. So there's a wide variety of case studies that, that are out there in the literature and things that have been done here at Bend Research. Some of those uh, go across the core coating dosage form spectrum as shown in the table here. Earlier, Chris talked about case study A, which was azithromycin. Uh, that did actually use a vehicle to, 
help with the chase masking and the combination of the vehicle with the modified release profile, not releasing all of the drug in an immediate release fashion in the mouth, led to acceptable taste in that case. The smooth, spherical, waxy nature of the material also helps with the mouthfeel of that two gram sachet uh, to suit the high dose requirement for that drug. If the goal is though to release zero drug in the, in the mouth, there's, we move into the coating options as shown in, in uh, case studies B through D. B and C are simple pH triggered. They're using melt spray congealed cores as the, as the drug substrate. And then those can be used in any dosage form, whether it's just a powder sprinkle or a, some sort of orally disintegrating tablet. And the taste masking is achieved by a coating that does not release any drug in the mouth, reverse enteric being a great example of that. Osmotic bursting is the, is the key piece of case study D, where we made a spray layered multi-particulate. This could be, a, again, a crystalline or an amorphous form for the solubility of the drug. And then using the osmotic bursting and swelling that we'll talk about in the next case study in detail, achieves that lag in the mouth that, to allow for taste masking. More traditional options might be a, a mini tablet that is just put into a capsule and swallowed, which you know, should lead to taste masking as well, but there's nothing designed into the core that, that allows that taste masking here. So we've talked about two case studies that, that use melt spray congeal and fluid bed, and I've been hinting at a third set that, that uses osmotic bursting. This particular set of problem statements that led to this project was a, a combination product and the desire for a delayed pulse to enable the pharmacodynamics of the project to be achieved. In this pulsatile relief case study, the key to success is the reproducible timing or the chronotherapy of the combination. The first drug was released in an IR fashion, and drug two, the goal was a three-hour delayed pulse. The goal is not to have that be pH dependent and therefore location dependent inside the gastrointestinal tract. So the, the cartoon and reality of an osmotic bursting multiparticulate are highlighted on this slide. It is a slightly more set of complex uh, coatings because there's numerous layers, but it's still just one unit operation, so that it's not a uh, it's not a, a large endeavor inside a GMP manufacturing. We start in this particular case with a, an inert core, put on a drug layer, essentially this one was crystalline drug bound on by a low viscosity polymer, but amorphous dispersions can be used in this particular layer. The key functional aspect here is one of them is the swelling layer, using a common oral super disintegrant in this particular layer bound on again by a low viscosity polymer. And then finally, the, the barrier coating. This is a water permeable layer, but it's, a, it's mechanically tough otherwise. You need the pressure, the osmotic pressure built up from below to break that barrier. And therefore, the barrier coating and the barrier composition are the keys to tuning the release rate from these osmotic bursting multiparticulates. Again, we can use aqueous or solvent-based coatings as necessary to achieve the mechanical properties of the coating and therefore the pharmacokinetic goal being met by, by that uh, combination. As we show on slide 23, the coat weight is essentially, the, the barrier coat weight is the key to tuning the release profile of the most particulate. Shown on the left is a simple set of three different coatings on the same core, and you can see the tunable lag that comes from you know, small changes in the coating weight. From 15 to 20 percent, we changed the lag from one to three hours, and in this case, meeting the pharmacokinetic goal of the Advancetron project, with a, essentially an IR to a short modified release profile that follows. The heavier the coating, the duration does start to flatten, but that's really a series of bursts that are core size dependent. Pulsatile goal in this particular case, you could show that in any single dissolution medium, but the hallmark here is that the osmotic bursting is pH independent because it's only based on water activity. 
I could make the requisite lawyer joke here, but I don't want to offend anyone that's really on the line. So the cartoon data that's shown is representative of what we see for multi particulates with osmotic bursting barriers. At low barrier coat weight, whether you're at the early in the small intestine or late in the small intestine, or it's moved on to the colon, we're getting the same time of release, and that's independent of pH. And it's also the coat weight is still able to tune the release profile that you're targeting. So there's no, no risk of changing the pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics by the location in the gastrointestinal tract which allows you to not worry about gastric retention, a fed fasted effect, or disease state transit times as long as it's released in an absorptive window for the drug. There haven't been uh, as many literature examples yet for IVIVR of osmotic bursting multiparticulates, but there's obviously a ton of precedent for osmotic tablets that we aren't discussing here today to have level A IVIVRs. But the concepts are the same, is that because of it only being related to water activity, the release profile in vitro and in vivo is usually conserved. This literature example I'm using uses acetaminophen, and in the table you can see between the in vitro and in vivo lag times that the times were very well conserved, and the, the thicker coating levels resulted in less oral release or absorption as shown in the bottom right profile or the AUC ratios of the table. So that ability to just rely on osmotic bursting and water activity as a fundamental phenomenon really allows you to tune through core coating and, and perhaps a dosage form the release rate that you need for a combination product or a delayed pulse. A final case study here uh, is a different set of problem statements, but one that's very common in the industry is to reduce or eliminate a food effect. Once that's done, though, you might need some, with a solubilized form, you might need some sort of modified release to keep within a safety or a, a toxicology window. So the case study I'm going to talk about uses solubilization followed by a modified release granulation to achieve those goals. This slide shows that the, the project objective was to improve upon a two-fold food effect for commercial geodon. That product is crystalline drug that's in a formulated capsule. The two-fold food effect stands in dogs or humans, as shown for dogs on the plot on the right side of slide 26. As we, succeed, we succeeded to remove the food effect for, by AUC measurement, as shown in this plot, by coming up with a solid nanocrystalline dispersion formulation for increasing the solubility of the drug. However, in dogs, you can tell that we matched the C-max, but in humans, that didn't actually occur, that the C-max went above where the fed capsule did. So we had to use modified release granules to, to modulate that C-max back towards where the product had, had uh, released. So a brief note on the solubilized form that we're using in this particular case study. Solid nanocrystalline dispersions, or SNCDs, are essentially bottom-up generated nanocrystals that are created starting with a spray dry dispersion. A common unit op following spray drying is secondary drying. And any usual secondary drying, whether it's a standard tray dryer or an agitated stirred dryer that's equipped with humidity, can be used to generate the, the solid nanocrystalline dispersion. The goal for a water insoluble drug is to create a shower of nuclei by getting supersaturation with the humidity and those nuclei to exhaust the material around it so that there's no capability for growth. So what's shown in the TEM image next to the cartoon is 50 to 100 nanometer crystals in this cross-sectional TEM and those are the x-ray in the top right graph also shows uh, a stark difference in the peak broadening between the crystalline and the nanocrystalline dispersion, and that broadening directly indicates the domain size. So I showed on the previous slide that the nanocrystalline dispersion eliminated the food effect in dogs, and that was also true in humans for AUC. However, in, in humans, we found that the C-max was above that of the commercial capsule fed at the same dose. So what we did here 
was come up with a formula, a composition and process that would allow us to keep the solubilized form and the benefits of redu reducing the food effect, but using composition and process to tailor the, the release profile and therefore the pharmacokinetics. In this particular case, we developed a wet extrusion process with those two independent handles, the first one being process and specifically the milled granule size. This plot shows the, how a composite milled material released roughly at 80% in two hours, but that was size dependent and strongly size dependent that if we sieved a larger or a smaller sieve cut, we could tailor that T80 at the same composition. Shown here in the table also is that we could tailor that release rate as a function of composition by mixing with another enteric polymer. So with those two handles of process composition, we created a set of granules and then mixed in an IR tablet the powdered solubilized form to get an initial burst or initial pharmacokinetic response and then some ratio of these modified release granules to modulate the PK such that we were within the window that was desired for the product here on um, uh, form D fed and fasted being that combination dosage form. So, in summary, if I can empower you with one thought for the day, it's that your drug is unique and special, and it requires a, a technology agnostic solution, probably. If we start with the target product profile and a specific drug, we can take a model-based approach with a commercial or in-house modeling packages to understand the pharmacokinetics required and a lead profile desired. The drug form may need to be solubilized, as we showed in that last form, in that last case study, in order to achieve that goal. But the technology constraints are very few. Uh, using the right one for your target product profile, we can select a scalable set of technologies to test in an API sparing fashion, and then use engineering tools to efficiently scale that up and achieve the pharmacokinetic goals together. With that, we'd like to open the field for questions and appreciate your time listening. Great. Well, thank you both so much for that presentation. That was great. Um, now I'd like to invite our audience to continue sending their questions and comments in right now using that questions window for the Q&A portion of this webinar. I've already received some questions, so I'm going to start with those. Uh, our first question. Was there any comparison of simple water soluble diluents versus uh, Loral on the effect of release? Your thoughts? So with the high dose requirement of the ZMAX um, case study that we showed, we wanted to keep the loading as high as possible for efficacy. And with the size requirements that were required for a good mouthfeel, we were essentially with the size also modifying the release rate, we were essentially constrained and didn't want to have too many soluble fillers in this particular case study. But in cases where the dose is lower or the size of your multiparticulate isn't limited by a sachet type of dosage form, one can certainly add other soluble entities as filler if it's better for your dosage form in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, one, one other important thing to note that the um the real key for the soluble uh, enhancer is, is that the, uh, the pore former is basically able to bridge uh, between the different drug crystal molecule, drug crystals within the multi-particulate there. Um, if you were to include um, another crystalline um, water-soluble agent there, uh, it would need to be able to be in direct contact with the other crystals there so you can form the bridge so you can actually have a pathway for it to leave out. Uh, the Lutrol had uh, a unique uh, feature there in allowing it to uh, essentially uh, act as a, almost as a liquid pour uh, former when it was in the molten state there and, uh, to, to connect the, the crystalline uh, suspension together. So I hope that answers the question. If not, please follow up. Great. Well, thanks. That was interesting. Um, our next question here, have you investigated the use of an electronic tongue for taste masking studies 
And if so, or if not, is there a reason why this does or doesn't work for your needs? We have not explored that particular application, and it's definitely a good idea, one that if that could be used to you know, mimic the results of a taste panel or a clinical trial for your specific drug would be, you know, anything that helps define what that taste threshold would be and minimizes the constraint on the dosage form, we'd be more than uh, encourage you to use. Right, okay. Um, do you see any uh, MSC technology limited to non-thermal labile drugs, uh, less than 120 degrees centigrade, for example? So, uh, yeah, the, the thermal, uh, the impact of, of temperature on your API is a pretty important thing to, to keep, take into account when uh, looking at the MSC as a technology to see if that would be an acceptable uh, uh, technology there. It is a relatively short uh, period of time that it's maintained at temperature there. Um, but if you do have any uh, um, uh, thermal uh, issues with the compound, that, that certainly would not be a, a, a technology that you'd want to start with. We can tailor the materials a little bit, which allows us to tailor the temperatures, but it's a fairly safe um, entity that if we're greater than you know, that 110, 120 degrees, we'd like to have that 40 to 50 degree window between the, the waxy melt and the drug melt point in order to avoid the generation of dissolved material that may be more prone to that thermal ability. Right, right, okay. Um, our next question here, and a reminder to the audience just to keep sending those questions and comments and rolling in. Um, our next question, what drivers do you have for using solubilized forms with controlled release? Your thoughts? It's a great question, and it goes back to you know, that, that last case study, perhaps, is that to achieve usually a fed fasted ratio is it's not being absorbed in one of those states. Whether it's a positive food effect or negative food effect, you're getting a, a vast difference in the dissolution, the amount of drug that's dissolved and ready to permeate across the uh, GI wall, various layers. So usually to, to get rid of that fed fasted effect, you're going to need a, a solubilized form in some way, shape, or form. If you're if you have a bioequivalent entity, you might be able to use a crystalline IR form, and, and you know, like we did, in G, like was performed in Geodon, and then need so the combination of solubilized forms and modified release in order to achieve, you know, bioequivalence or uh, a, a toxicology window, a therapeutic window that's appropriate. And just one other area to add there is where a, um, a solubilized form can be used in conjunction with control release is uh, if, you're, if you have a, a moderate to poor colonic absorption where uh, you're going to require a, a, that added uh, bump that you can get from the, the solubilized uh, form to allow you to maintain a consistent absorption over uh, uh, throughout the entire GI tract. Right, okay. Thank you. Um, our next question here. Are there problem statements that are better suited for tablets? We talked earlier about osmotic bursting multiparticulates and their likely ability to, to show a strong IV IVR. Osmotic tablets, their hallmark throughout time since they were developed by ALSA and others, was that they have a level A in vitro and vivo relationship that because they're based only on water activity, they can be uh, very reproducible in, the, in a different fed fasted state or in different disease state versus a uh, healthy population. So that's the one place where I think, you know, those multiparticulates um, can show IV IVRs like that, but I don't think they're as reproducibly strong uh, as osmotic tablets. The other portion there is that um, we can use solubilized forms in both modified, in osmotic or matrix tablets and sometimes the drug loadings can be higher than, you know, if you start with a spray layered multiparticulate, an inert core, and start to apply layers on top of it. Obviously, the processes for a matrix tablet are also 
fairly readily available relative to solvent-based coating, uh, whether that's for osmotic tablets or for multi-particulates. So again, it's, it, it's a balance of what the, what the project needs and uh, how complex we have to get to achieve that. Okay, interesting, thank you. Um, our next question, does a client have to always go with a full-blown clinical trial with drug release modification technology or can you follow something like a 505B2 pathway uh, to avoid testing and bringing the drug faster to the market? So a, a 505B2 pathway, you know, that would be something akin to the fourth case study where you started with a, a crystalline IR form and then used a, a solubilized form with modified release to achieve essentially bioequivalence but now you might have a lower dose or you've eliminated the food effect to show medical need. My understanding is that it still does require clinical trials in any case, but that's usually the length and the extent of those clinical trials determine the exclusivity that the FDA generates. So that's not a case where uh, biowaivers can get around, and, and to my understanding of the, of the regulatory, you can't use a biowaiver to get around the uh, clinical study need. Right, okay, thank you. Um, one more question, I think. Uh, do you see variability in drug release profiles of osmotic multi-particulate systems between hydrophilic and uh, lipophilic activities? Sorry, <laughs> hydrophilic and lipophilic actives. Oh. Um, yeah, so for the uh, um, there's a couple of uh, um, different osmotic multi-particulates. For uh, uh, the osmotic uh, bursting multi-particulates, uh, no, we don't, we don't see a lot of variability there um, in terms of uh, one particular class of API being uh, more variable than the other just based solely on whether it's a, a hydro, a hydrophilic or if it's lipophilic there. Um, do you want to? I think you know, usually a lipophilic active would be something that we might make an amorphous dispersion layer and therefore it would be more soluble than the standard lipophilic active would it be as a crystalline entity. But the, the burst that comes from the uh, swelling layer, barrier layer combination into a sink medium is essentially independent of that drug below unless it has such a high solubility that it helps generate some of the osmotic pressure that enables burst. Right, okay. Well, thank you both for those answers. We had some great questions there. Uh, we have reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. If you do have further questions, you can direct them to Alyssa Barrett at alyssa.barrett at bendresearch.com or you can phone 1-800-706-8655. Thank you everyone for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen and your participation is appreciated as it will help us improve our further webinars. Now please join us in thanking our speakers, Chris Craig and Dr. Brett Caldwell. We hope that you found this conference informative. Have a great day everyone.